morning, everybody. So welcome to uh, Gap Creek and happy Easter. Uh, it's very strange not to be celebrating Easter in church. I think that's probably the first time in my whole life I haven't been in church on Easter Sunday and I miss it, but uh, I'm glad we have this time together. Um, since, since we're not going to be in church today, my uh, wife got all the girls dressed up in their Easter dresses yesterday uh, so we could get pictures in the sunshine since it's supposed to rain today. So uh, here's that, and it's just a way of saying happy, happy Easter from our family to yours. Uh, I'm especially sad to miss the sunrise service. I was really looking forward to that. It's been a long time since, I, um, since I've been to a sunrise service. I used to go with my uncle Carlos when he preached uh, up in Sevier County. In fact, sometime, uh, if you catch me, I have a funny story about that, but I don't have time to tell you uh, now. Uh, I, I've always liked the sunrise services because I like the symbolism of that movement from darkness to light and you always sort of stand there's always a moment in a sunrise service where you're standing in the twilight between dark and light uh, and I think that's pretty profound it's a pretty profound way to think about Easter right in a lot of ways Easter is the moment in which we step into the light we move from darkness to light uh, at Christmas time we'll often read that prophecy the um, the people have seen a great light and, and I think of Christmas as that moment when we sort of see the light off in the distance, right? It's coming. Jesus is born and it's coming. But then when Easter comes, the light emerges and we step into it as you step out of the dark uh, into the light. But it's also okay. Part of the power of that symbolism is that it's okay to pause for a moment and to kind of look back and remember the darkness. Um, we spent some time this weekend thinking about people we've lost. Uh, this past year, and I think that's a healthy thing to do. Michelle's father died uh, last April, uh, around Easter time. Uh, we've lost several other people who are dear to us, and and it's it's good to remember that. It's good to remember um, that the pain of losing them, but it's also good to remember at Easter the hope of the resurrection, right? That we know that we'll see them uh, again one day. Easter also asks us, along those lines, Easter also asks us to think about what the resurrection means for us now. Um, there's more to the resurrection than just something that's going to happen, right? I do think about seeing my father-in-law uh, again in the resurrection, but there's also a part of the resurrection which is really concerned with, with kind of who we are now, what it means to truly have hope. If we have hope, right? If we have hope that Jesus will come again, if we have hope that we'll rise again, then what does that mean? How does that change uh, who we are and how we experience the world. Uh, hope is a very tricky thing. I, I think for the most part, we're very optimistic. I think we live in hope uh, for the most part. We get up uh, and, and think that there is some possibility uh, about the world that seems optimistic. Um, now, I, I sometimes dip into Facebook and I, I lose sight of that sometimes. Facebook can be very angry, but most of us, for the most part, uh, are very hopeful. Uh, we were going through old pictures uh, the other day and, and found this picture of my oldest daughter uh, sitting in our uh, front sidewalk uh, with her um, with her thing of lemonade that she had made. She woke up and decided that she was going to make a lot of money today by selling lemonade in front of our house. And so she um, was very energetic and happy about it. And we helped her. We got all the ingredients, the sugar and the lemons uh, and the water. And we squeezed the lemons and we put it all together and mixed it up. Uh, and she helped and it was very exciting and she um, was very energetic as she took all of her stuff out uh, to the front and set up her little table and her chair and put up her cups and her sign that said lemonade five cents uh, and was all ready to go and just sat there and, and I watched her. I sat on the porch and watched her for a little while um, and you could see her kind of sitting up straight, um, ready for anybody to come by, looking hopefully every time a car came down the street. Uh, but then nobody came. It was just one of those days when nobody walked by her house all day. And as she sat, you could just see the hope, see her kind of deflate, right, as the hope sort of left. Uh, and by the end, she was just kind of sitting there slumped, um, not giving up, but pretty hopeless, pretty sure that, that nothing was going to happen. I, I think that happens to us. I think that, that we find uh, our instinct is to put our hope in things that tend not to work. And so what we do is just keep replacing it. We, we hope in something and then it doesn't work and then we hope in something and it doesn't work. Uh, and, and it becomes this sort of cycle of, um, of hope and failure and hope and failure. Uh, we put our hope in jobs, we put our hope in politics, we put our hope in, um, in all sorts of things.
But the problem is that none of these hopes are real and so they don't work. And like my daughter, we end up waiting, we pursue these hopes, but we just end up waiting for the next car to come down the road to make us happy, to make us content, to find us some sort of peace and joy. And they always fail because the hopes themselves are not fail, are not real. And, and why don't they work? Well, the Bible is pretty clear uh, about a, at least a couple of reasons why they don't work. One is that they're temporary, that the things we place our hopes on will always fail us because they will always go away. It's certainly true of, of things we're putting our hopes in now, science and politics and um, uh, and even relationships, right? All of those things are just going to go away. And as good as some of those things are, they're temporary. And so they aren't sufficient for us to build a true hope on. Um, another reason, and, and again, the Bible is very clear about this. Another reason that these hopes don't work is because they're misguided. That they're even sinful in a way. Um, and because they're built on this kind of corrupt foundation, then they don't work. And so if we build our hopes on things like fear or things like self-centeredness, um, thinking of ourselves first, um, they don't allow us to draw from our true hope, which is our hope in the resurrection. I think this was, this was what Paul was getting at in one of our readings from today, from Colossians uh, 3. Uh, he tells us to put to death um, all of these sort of temporary earthly things that are corrupt. And he lists a whole bunch of um, behaviors that he finds that people put hope in, but that are ultimately going to fail. And then he says, though, then he flips it around and says, as people in the resurrection, uh, here's, here's how we should think of ourselves, what our true hope actually looks like, he says. Uh, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. This is what it means to be hope. When we have hope, then we can finally live for the true truth. We can recognize what is actually real in the world and figure out ways in our discipleship, in our attempt to follow Christ, to live out those virtues. Uh, many of you knew my grandfather, who my grandmother and grandfather, who lived almost immediately across the street from Gap Creek Church. Um, as, as you drive by, next time you drive by, look at their house. Um, it sits up a little bit, um, and between on Kimberlin Heights Road, it sits up a little bit. Uh, and there's a bank. There's a kind of sloping bank that goes from there, uh, from what was their yard to um, the road. Uh, my grandfather hated mowing that bank. He would mow all day long, but he hated mowing that bank. Uh, and so he spent a great deal of time trying to think of ways to make mowing that bank easier. Uh, and I assisted him in several of those schemes. One of his best schemes was getting me to do it. I would go over and he would con me into mowing it. Um, when I wasn't around, he, uh, I remember him uh, one time bringing up a pulley system. He got an old white lawnmower and had ropes and was trying to drag it up and down. That didn't really work. Uh, I just kept trying everything. Uh, one time the, the highway department was out on the highway um, with one of their big bush hog, uh, and he actually went out and talked them into doing it one time. He's very proud of that because he didn't have to do anything at all. Um, so, um, so it was with a little bit of surprise. It was later, um, later in his life before they finally had to um, move out. Uh, I was coming home from college and I stopped by. I was going to spend a couple days with him, and I pulled in and, and I just noticed. I kind of vaguely noticed. I didn't pay all that much attention, but I noticed that the bank was overgrown. Um, I didn't really think of it, and uh, the light, rest of the lawn looked fine, and I, I drove up, and um, and he heard my car, heard the door, and so he came out, he was in his shop, and he came out. Uh, we went in the shop for a minute, and he was kind of puttering around and showing me the stuff he was working on, and as we were talking, uh, we heard another car come up. Uh, so we went out to see who it was, and it was a pickup truck, um, kind of bounced up the bounced up the road, and we noticed it had a lawnmower in the back, which is a little strange. Um, so we went out, and it was a, it was a kid from the college, guy from the college, uh, and he had come over, um, hopped out, and, and walked up. You know, we chatted for a second, and he said, well, uh, I'm thinking about buying this new fancy lawnmower, and I thought I'd bring it over and, and try it out on your bank, because I, I figure if it can cut that, it can cut anything. So if you don't mind, I'll just run it down and, and take a couple passes at it. Well, that was a little strange, but, but Grandpa said sure, and um, so we went over to the back of the truck and helped him lift the, the lawnmower down. 
Um, and we wheeled it down and Grandpa and I sort of stood in the shade and watched as he, uh, as this kid mowed, uh, took him, it was a heavy lawnmower and it wasn't really ideal for that, that kind of work, but he did it, right? It took him uh, several minutes, several passes and he, he mowed the bank and it looked good. Uh, and then we wheeled the lawnmower back up and, uh, and they talked about it. They looked it over and, and uh, sort of admired all of its features and we lifted it back up in the truck. Uh, and the kid got, got in the truck and drove away. For me, that kid, that moment, was a real sign of hope. It would be easy to imagine um, someone driving down the road and not noticing the bank. It would be easy to imagine someone not really caring to know enough about my grandfather to know that story, right? To know how much he, um, how it had become a kind of running joke of all the work he'd put into running the bank. It'd be easy to imagine someone driving down the road and looking at that and, and kind of being grumpy that this part was overgrown and it didn't look nice. I do that all the time uh, myself. But that's not what happened. Someone drove down the road, saw this, and in an act of deep hope, um, responded with compassion and with humility and kindness and all of the things that are the signs of the resurrection. And so we brought over a lawnmower and mowed the bank. Uh, and that for me is what it means to live in hope. And so that's my prayer for us this week and for the rest of, rest of this Easter season, that we learn to live in hope, that we learn to live for Christ and in living for Christ, we learn to live for each other. Amen. Amen. Alleluia. Alleluia.